Me one, uh, could you please uh, lead us in prayer, please? Um, I can pray, Pastor. Yes, yes, Rose, please. Thank you. Um, Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you for the many ways you provide, you protect, and you preserve us. Thank you for your unending and unconditional love for us. We thank you that for the next few hours of being in this school, and we devote and we commit them to you. Father, help us focus our hearts and minds now on what we are about to learn. Inspire us more and move us by your Holy Spirit as we listen and understand to what we are about to hear. Inspire our teacher, Pastor Nancy, and speak through her. Speak through her your words of wisdom, Lord. Guide us all by the light that comes from your word. Father, allow us to discover you more and your ways. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Um, so we'll uh, continue on uh, uh, the subject that we have at hand. Uh, in the last class, we were talking about the house of God being uh, the bride uh, of Christ. And then we also looked at the fact that we have to be a house of prayer and a house of worship. Uh, and we mainly studied about the tabernacle of David and how uh, he presented a very different worship uh, as compared to his contemporaries where he engaged in extravagant worship, when he, ex uh, he engaged in um, continuous worship uh, and excellent worship. So uh, we saw how that pleased God because uh, the worship that David offered God was um, very intentional. Uh, the worship that he offered God was, um, you know, the best that uh, that he could offer. Uh, and uh, um, anyone who followed that same pattern of worship later on, we listed out the names of some uh, kings. And we said that all of them saw victory. They saw uh, some form of blessing, prosperity upon the land because of the same nature of worship which they followed. Uh, and Amos, the prophet, you know, uh, spoke God's heart. And uh, he prophesied that God was getting ready to rebuild the tabernacle of David and reestablish it in the days to come. Uh, but we know that whenever God speaks about uh, Zion or Israel, you know, we look forward for the literal manifestation, for the literal fulfillment of what the word has spoken. But usually the way God works is that he brings about spiritual completion first and then the literal completion happens. So uh, when the prophet Amos spoke about rebuilding of the tabernacle of David, we know that at some point, literally, you know, uh, we'll have uh, the Lord Jesus establish his rule and reign on the earth. And we will have that form of continual worship taking place, uh, you know, uh, sometime in the future. Uh, but right now, what God uh, will make happen is the fulfillment of the tabernacle in the spiritual sense. And we know that the spiritual Zion or the uh, spiritual Israel is the body of believers. Um, so God is going to rebuild or reestablish the tabernacle of David in the church first. And then, you know, that will uh, be literally re-established in the earth. So that is something that we are looking forward to. And, you know, we could also say that, you know, God is doing it right now. And we see several movements that are 24 bar 7 worship intercession that are taking place. Uh, and we are only going to see an increase of that in the days to come. Now, uh, we've understood that God wants to rebuild that tabernacle. And uh, James, the then leader of the first century church, you know, he rose up and he caught, quoted the same text, the uh, prophecy of Amos about rebuilding the tabernacle in the context of uh, bringing the Gentiles into the kingdom of God. Because uh, what was happening at that point is the 
uh, apostles and the believers knew that Christ had died for the Jewish people, but it was hard for them to accept when God started moving upon the Gentiles. You know, you had uh, Cornelius who went, uh, who, you had Peter who went and ministered to Cornelius uh, and uh, Later on, you know, the uh, apostles brought an issue that was going on in the church of uh, um, Antioch, which had to do with the Gentiles to the apostles. So when uh, the apostles engaged in the matters of Gentiles, uh, most of the people did not like it. But at that point, as a leader, James had to stand up and remind the people that this is not um, the apostles idea. This is not the leadership of the you know, first century church's idea, but this was God's promise back in the uh, times when Amos prophesied. So uh, James quotes Amos uh, and he says that when the tabernacle of David is rebuilt, this is what God had promised. He had said that uh, he will bring the Gentiles who are called by his name, uh, that, you know, God will bring them back, bring them into the fold. So what can we expect when the tabernacle of David is rebuilt? So one of the things that we can expect is people coming to Christ, people being saved, you know, us having a, 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 a large harvest. Now, the term Gentiles uh, in uh, the prophecy of Amos, you can just look at that as unbelievers. Okay, So we're not you know, going into technically who's a Gentile, okay, they will get saved. It's not uh, necessarily that, but the term Gentile there is referring to unbelievers. So when we rebuild the tabernacle of David, which is 24 bar 7, praise, worship, intercession, we can expect a, uh, uh, we can expect a harvest. That's the point. Uh, so today, as we see uh, this movement, praise, worship, and intercession um, being re-established here on the earth, uh, we can expect you know, God to move upon the regions where we live. And uh, uh, what we are really living for is, is to worship God and the Great Commission. right? So we can see uh, God doing that and much more. Now, we will not go into all the results of pursuing the presence of God, because all those results are applicable, right? When we pursue the presence of God, we uh, will have uh, the manifestation of his glory in our midst. Now, that is something that, you know, we uh, really look forward to. Um, and so many things that come with that, you know, manifesting God's glory, uh, that has to do with the revelation that comes uh, into the lives of the people that uh, uh, that is about the blessings of God that we will experience. That is about the supernatural power of God, which we will experience. So pursuing the presence of God brings all of that. In addition to that, very specifically uh, through Amos's prophecy, we know that God is going to draw people to himself. So the great commission, the harvest is something that we can look forward to. Uh, and we also uh, briefly looked at the worship that is going on in the throne room. So uh, in scripture, we generally see this pattern. God, uh, you know, what, what we see God instituting is usually a shadow of what already exists. So uh, 24 bar 7 worship. Yes, David um, was the first person who initiated that. Uh, and yet, when we look at the throne room of God in heaven, we see a continuous worship taking place. You know, you have the angels, you have the elders, you um scriptures talk about the multitudes standing around the throne of God and giving him the glory and the honor and the praise and everything that is, you know, due uh, to him because he's worthy. So the continuous worship that is already happening in heaven. Okay, it's nothing new because that's the God we serve who deserves our worship uh, at all times. And he deserves our worship. He deserves our praises continually. So this rebuilding of the tabernacle is like a shadow. It's a, a shadow or it's uh, uh, in line with what is already happening in heaven. So we are kind of just um, tuning into the worship of heaven. So that's where we stopped in the last class. And uh, we uh, just started looking at some of the movements that have already come about on the earth. 
one uh, particular person who started this form of prayer without ceasing uh, in fact based on that scripture first thessalonians 5:17 where paul writes pray without ceasing so alexander akimet is one of the monks uh, in uh, 400 ad uh he wanted to live out that scripture so he gathered some other followers with him and uh, they started praying continuously they started engaging in intercession uh and you know uh, he established this night and day form of prayer um to the extent where you know these people would not sleep so they came to be known as uh uh they came to be known as alexander akimetus and the sleepless ones so you know there's an attempt you see an attempt there of engaging in 24 bar 7 uh intercession uh, so uh, that's uh, an example from history another very uh, well known example i know that we have touched on this uh, when we studied uh, prayer and intercession you probably would have also touched on this uh, when uh, you know you you did other subjects but it's good to always look at uh, you know good things repetitively so uh, in history we have the moravian revival okay, that we talk about so the moravian revival what was the fuel for the moravian revival it was the 24 bar 7 intercession that the people were engaged in so the um, the story goes something like uh, uh, there were refugees uh, you know sent out of a particular place and they found shelter with uh, a man called uh, count zinzendorf uh, in hernhut uh, you know uh, moravia and in that place uh, just you know the, these people were given shelter but uh, count zinzendorf was a godly man and he wanted for these people to also experience god so he kind of led them uh, into routines of prayer and you know uh, having gatherings of uh, gatherings where people could worship god people could break bread people could listen to god's word so services began within that community uh, of hornhut and as time went by uh, you know there was one particular um, service uh, during Uh, you know it it was a communion service and god's presence was very special you know something about the manifest presence of god and uh, uh, picking up from there what zinzendorf did is he realized that god wanted something greater to be done uh, you know from that moment on so he just asked for people who would commit their time for prayer and uh, 24 men 24 women gave their time and they kind of signed up for this 24 Uh, you know bar 7 chain prayer so men were doing a 24 bar 7 chain prayer and women were doing the same thing uh, and so what started on that day in fact the date is august the 13th august the 13th and uh, uh, zinzendorf um, called it a day of the outpourings of the holy spirit upon the congregation it was its pentecost so the pentecost of the community uh, so the prayer which began at that point you know we read that it went on for a hundred years so basically the chain didn't stop you know people kept signing up and people kept praying uh, so this started in 1727 you know went through uh, the 1800s uh, so what is so special about engaging in this kind of 24 bar 7 prayer 24 bar 7 intercession uh, a lot of in results or the impact of the moravian revival is what we generally um look at so because people were praying in this manner uh, we we see that a missionary movement was born out of uh, the moravian revival in those days missionaries would go out but uh, you would have a mm, like you know the ratio was was really um not that impressive so for a population of about 5000 people there would be one missionary you know would go out but after the moravian revival took place uh, and the prayer went on you know god had changed something in the hearts the lives uh, the the uh, the the spiritual realm right and impacting the natural realm so so many things had changed uh, that people started 
moving out you know on their own they were impressed by god and they started stepping out as missionaries so quite a number of missionaries uh, you know went out and it is said that in regions where the ratio was 5000 to 1 uh, it it became 60 to 1 so you can imagine You know, so many missionaries stepped out and to have a missionary zeal you know that's not something that uh, we can conjure up or we can um, you know sort of uh, stir up in people that's something only god can give that kind of a missionary zeal to step out to sacrifice to you know be out there in the mission field to to share the gospel to um, bring people into the kingdom but it happened as a result of the moravian revival um so we we see why do we talk about the moravian revival so much because uh, you know this is one of the main things the the way missionaries were sent out you know uh, from the and in fact from the same community from the same moravian community so uh, that's amazing you know this is what uh, engaging in prayer and worship can do this is what engaging in intercession can do and um, it's noted that people like uh, william uh, carey uh, people like john wesley they were all um, influenced by the moravian revival in one way or the other so you know that's uh, the impact there for us so this is to encourage our hearts you know when we are engaging in prayer uh, i'm sure that you know all our church communities have something like this going on um, you know we might feel at that point that hey nothing immediate is happening you know we're engaging in worship maybe momentarily we take back uh, the the peace the joy of god's presence and you know all of that but then we might wonder uh, as to what the outcome of this kind of commitment to worship or commitment to intercession can be but what we have seen is that whenever people have engaged in a uh, you know this this 24 bar 7 like the tabernacle of david pattern uh, of of uh, uh, going after god you know there is a definite and a very powerful impact okay um, and, and that can happen in different ways so the moravian uh, community is a great example uh, uh, in our notes here we also have the example of the prayer mountain this was established by dr cho a dr david yongi cho uh, in 1973 um as um, a part of the you know their their ministry in seoul korea so basically they established a prayer mountain a place where people could go they could see god um uh, you know they could you just go on retreats for days weeks months and just be praying okay and uh, when this was established as soon as it was established uh, we see that you know a lot of people were attracted to the place uh, and uh, it is uh, recorded that their visitors were up to a million a year okay so they started out up to a million people would come in a year to pray on that prayer mountain so you know you see um, how god is rekindling that that um passion for 24 bar 7 prayer and intercession so this is again a good example and dr cho talks about how uh because of investing in prayer his church uh grew uh, in in korea and not just that but the church had a great impact on the um the city and the nation and we know you know it's it's the second largest church right now in the world so uh there is a connection right between prayer intercession worship and the uh, coming in the in gathering of souls into the kingdom of god okay the next example here in our notes is the international house of prayer uh, kansas city you know many of you um, probably know and follow you know mike bickel Uh, so there was a prayer session that started out a prayer meeting that started out on the 19th of september in 1999 and the the story is similar to uh, the moravian prayer movement uh, and zinzendorf what started on that particular day hasn't stopped yet so uh, what the team did was they they started engaging prayer leaders and worship leaders continuously uh, such that 
the the worship and prayer you know they have prayer rooms they they have worship rooms and it still goes on and you know some of you probably know that uh, uh, it's also uh, live streamed so if you just want to join the prayer room uh, you can you can join from anywhere uh, in the world so that's another uh, recognized movement that uh, we have seen but obviously you know there there are many other uh, unrecorded movements uh, many other you know, regional prayer movements uh, you know that uh, uh, exist we probably just don't know about it okay but we know god's word god has spoken and said that he is going to re-establish this form of 24 bar 7 engaging in prayer and worship and god's house is supposed to be a house of uh, prayer and supposed to be a house of worship so we must engage in it and when we see the lord working in this way uh, you know we can encourage that um, and uh, see an increase okay? um, yeah so we must become a people who cry out to god day and night um, and crying out to god day and night uh, is not a new concept we have old testament scriptures uh, that uh, talk about how uh, you know we are watchmen on the walls and we keep calling out to god or we we seek god day and night okay and um, uh, our cries go out to the lord day and night uh, in luke chapter 18 verses 1 uh, and 7 we see jesus referring to um, that uh, persistent prayer okay uh, and over there he says uh, if god will he not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him Okay, so the day and night concept of engaging in in prayer or seeking God, uh, it's always existed, and uh, uh, you know even Jesus advocated for it, and we can engage in that form of seeking God. So how do we go about uh, establishing this? The first thing is always to um, speak the truth of God's word. You know when we when um, even when we talked about the church being the pillar of truth, we said that. To get people moving in a certain direction, the truth about that matter needs to be proclaimed. The truth from God's word. So how will people know uh, that you know, God delights in um, the tabernacle of David? We teach about it. We preach about it. You know, we, we share. We let people know that this is what God's word says. So the moment we teach people, they receive the understanding that, oh, okay, you know, this is God's word. This is what God is going to do in our times. Let's engage in it. So they, the understanding comes. And uh, that is how the, the church or the community of believers begins to engage in this form of worship so that that is something then um, we can also encourage uh, prophetic worship we can en encourage prophetic worship because we've seen in the tabernacle of david um, there there was a lot of space for the prophetic you know god's spirit would minister uh, through the songs through the music so we as uh, churches as worship teams uh, can make place for that you know we uh, so the the format that we follow we can um you know uh allow god to minister we we can encourage our teams that yeah you know we can have a set of songs uh that are listed out for the worship time but be open be sensitive to the moving of the spirit if you sense that god is leading you in a certain way to say something or play a particular tune just go with it right so we encourage prophetic worship and when it comes to intercession uh, we can engage in a more targeted kind of intercession by that uh, what we mean is the the mapping format so in the mapping format uh, we will study our environment we will study uh, you know our city and whichever place we are praying for uh, and then maybe list out as the holy spirit leads us we can list out okay these are the social issues these are the needs of the people these are the spiritual strongholds so we list all those things out and then we uh, start to pray in a targeted fashion okay so um, that is also something that we can do in a practical uh, sense then we can have these these prolonged periods of worship, prolonged periods of intercession established in our communities. Uh, we can incorporate it 
and into our um, community prayer time. So uh, generally, in most of the churches, we have uh, our Sunday services that we run and a midweek, maybe a midweek service that takes place. So whatever, uh, whatever programs are there, you kind of build it into that if possible, because then we are giving an opportunity for everyone to engage. So, uh, uh, you know, like here at APC, we have a pre-service prayer time. So uh, about half an hour, we we go uh, for people who come in for service, uh, right? We encourage everyone to come uh, in the morning. It's another thing that you don't have <laughs> a great attendance, um, you know, for the prayer times as you have for the service. But still, you know, there is a faithful crowd that does show up. So we engage in, in prayer. Um, see, it's an opportunity where we can invite everyone everyone in the church and say, hey, prayer time is open. Everybody come. So in that way, in the common services or the common programs, if we um, start introducing you know, prayer, intercession, um, people will take to it. You know, they will they will also learn. OK, this is how. OK, fine. We'll uh, we engage in prayer. These are this is the way you know, we will pray for uh, these these points. This is the way we'll be led by the spirit. This is the way we will declare decree. So they engage. In, in intercession. In addition to this, we can have special times of uh, prayer and intercession, uh, things like, you know, here we have five days of prayer where we set aside twice a year. We just set aside time to come together, extended uh, hours of, of prayer and intercession, um, you know, that, that we engage in. So that is, uh, I'm just giving you some examples. I'm sure you, know, you have your own uh, patterns and formats uh, and then also uh, maybe doing the all night long prayer worship um, but one thing of course to uh, keep in mind it's it's coming in the next section their challenges is to recognize that people may not be used to extended hours of um, praise and worship of prayer so we have to build it you know gradually uh, and then slowly people are able to stretch themselves uh, and uh, focus in prayer and uh, keep continuing on with extended hours of prayer and worship. So yeah, in this way, depending on our local church, depending on our congregation, we can, we can introduce the people to um, uh, progressively um, extending patterns and then they, they'll be more comfortable to engage in this form of prayer and worship. Then uh, we can encourage people in their smaller groups also to have um, these forms of prayer and intercession. Now, um, maybe, you know, smaller groups, they just get together just for a time of worship, just for a time of prayer and intercession. So uh, that that passion kind of, uh, you know, is, is birthed in the hearts of the people. They realize the value of this. They realize the importance of, of doing this. And so, you know, people start engaging in it. Then um, we could also work towards a 24 bar 7 house of prayer, uh, the kind that we have discussed. Uh, you know, Dr. Cho established a, a prayer mountain, uh, the house of prayer uh, in Kansas City. These are all dedicated places of prayer where they have uh, uh, designated this only for 24 bar 7 prayer. So God might call uh, us, our ministries, to do something like this. So we might have to choose a place. We might have to choose uh, people, appoint people as God leads us, uh, you know, to have worship leaders, intercessors, prepare them spiritually, um, and also, uh, you know, make provision. Because if we are calling people to engage in something like this, then how about, uh, you know, uh, if uh, some will be part time, so maybe they, they'll have a job, they'll finish their job, uh, have an income and they'll come uh, in their free time and engage. They will lead worship or they will uh, lead prayer. But what about those who will commit to um, just doing this? So maybe the, the church will have to pay them, right? So maybe they will become full time uh, uh, intercessors and uh, worship leaders. Because if we are going this in this direction, the ministry has to make provision. Because 24 bar 7, how are these people going to, to um, live their lives? 
okay uh, if they come at all their time to prayer and worship and david actually did that he paid people he uh, just told them to engage in in prayer and uh, intercession worship and he made it possible for people to uh, live comfortably right while they were dedicated to a cause of this sort um, and i've also heard uh, in the kansas city house of prayer uh, they they have uh, different options you know some are full time some are part time uh, some are only for the for the night prayer sessions right uh, so they conduct the night prayer sessions and to the extent that there are some people who are living their life on a different schedule so they are awake during the night and they kind of you know it's like your night shifts but there are some people who have accustomed uh, you know their their lifestyle to that so they can engage in this form of prayer and worship for months and even years uh, yeah so this is um, you know what we have in this chapter here uh, and one more challenge that uh, we might encounter is um, the um, the worship leaders and the intercessors you know when we are looking at extended times uh, they might become tired so we have to be very very um, mindful of that so even david you know uh, we we saw how he had so many singers had so many uh, uh, musicians and there were there were um rosters so you know he had different teams that would minister at different points so that is a, a practical thing that we can use because if we have only one or two worship leaders and we tell them okay we're going to have three days of uh, praise worship intercession uh, your lead so you imagine two worship leaders how can they sustain right for 24 uh, hours into 3 it's very difficult so if we have teams then what we can do is we can give them slots and and say okay we have four teams uh, so uh, each team can take up two hours um, and you know then the next team comes on to lead in worship to lead in uh, intercession so that way uh, because we are mortal beings we still live in a physical body and we have to make sure that uh, people are well rested and uh, you know it doesn't affect their health right so these are some of the practical issues that we must be mindful about um so i i will pause uh, at this point um we can discuss a couple of things and then you know move on to the next chapter uh, any any thoughts any um inputs any testimonies no uh Thank you, Pastor. I just want to kind of contribute something um, based yes. on my church experience. Um, so sure. I, I remember, I remember in my the the former church I was, um, we used to have um, long hours of prayers, like forty hours, seventy two hours, like maybe towards the end of the year. And so, what the prayer coordinator would do would he would actually like have coffee. Um, tea just to keep people warm and then keep people alert so i just said that just basically you, you talked about ways of encouraging people i think that's another way you know just to encourage them that oh there's something you can always have when you're tired you provide what they provided water you know people would pray they'll get tired so all those little hit things go a long way in encouraging even the weakest in the church you know to be part of something like that so i just wanted to add that basically when you talked about encouraging your congregation in long hours of prayer yeah yeah thank you thank you say very practical um uh, yeah so thank you for sharing how it's done uh yes uh, charles you have something to add Yes, thank you so much pastor. Um even us here what we do is to prepare some warm water especially when we are we are having corporate corporate prayers when we are together face to face uh, before the 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 lockdowns and covid-19 we would be having the, those corporate prayers when we are in face to face gathering 
So we'd be praying, and when you need something to drink, there is some hot water. Sometimes we would put add sugar so that people would not lose strength or for prayer. So we would be there, and the the church would provide would provide some little money. But again, as we would meet, we would do some offering again, and that money from the offering would also be used for for such uh, such um, provisions of drinks and some bites. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Charles. I'm sure that helps. So some refreshments, something to strengthen. Yeah, okay, Prabhakar, um, face to face, would have 24 bar 7 praise and worship for a few days in a month. Yeah, there's a ministry called Face to Face. So uh, they have, uh, is it three days, Prabhakar? Three days, seven days? Would you know? I think uh, a week, I guess, Pastor. A week, yeah, yeah. So, um, yes, I, I know. Uh, I mean, I've personally attended uh, some of these sessions, not through the night though, but uh, I have friends who have attended, and uh, you know, they've all been very, very blessed by these worship sessions. And also, they have a hall, um, which is very comfortable, you know, it's kind of nice, nicely carpeted, so people sit on the, on the floor, they kind of lean on the wall they make themselves very comfortable and the worship goes on the pray the prayer intercession goes on for hours together and they, they also have a lot of worship leaders no prabhaka they keep taking turns to lead yes first of all, many of my friends also like uh, beginners mm. would go there and you know, mm. it was amazing place to worship yes yes true true yeah thank you thank you for sharing that yeah, so we have this ministry here in Bangalore. Uh, anyone else? Do you have? Uh, do you have um, like a house of prayer in your city? Any ministry that is running something that's twenty-four bar seven and it continues? Okay, so I suppose we do have extended periods of uh, uh, prayer and all, but uh, not continuous, isn't it? So we look forward for such ministries to be established. And uh, most definitely that strength, that motivation, the, the planning for something like this, it has to come from God. Otherwise, it's very hard to sustain, um, you know, a, a, no wonder it's called a movement. A movement like this uh, but well, let's pray let's trust God for more and more of this to happen in our midst because it's a it's an incredible blessing we are hosting God's presence by doing this and we are tapping into all the promises of God okay uh, that he has already given us so uh, any anything else if you would like to add it'll be good to kind of share now else we will move on to the next topic Okay, doesn't look like uh, we have any additional thoughts, so that's that's all right. Um, we can move to the next uh, topic here. So uh, the next chapter in our notes is the local church as the temple of God. So, so far we have considered the local church um, for various, uh, you know, functions responsibilities um uh, the nature that that god expects uh, of the local church to um sort of you know be to emerge right uh, with with various expressions so we've looked at it uh, and now as uh, we go forward we will talk about the local church being the temple of god so this word temple um uh for 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 the 
the Christians, um, we use the term church. So it may not be that familiar, but what is the understanding when we uh, use this word temple? Now, we will understand it based on the temple in the Old Testament. Now, the temple is a, a place where God's presence was hosted. Okay, So when we look at the church, that, that is the main, that is the basic point that we will we will uh, touch upon in this section where we are saying that temple is god's house temple is a place where god dwells temple is a place where god's presence um, you know manifests itself so apart from the church being a family apart from the church being god's body you know having to do certain things engage in the in the gifts that god has given us and still be united uh, apart from the church being an army, the church being a bride, the church being all those other things, it has to be the place where God chooses to live. I mean, imagine, we can try to be all those other things, but if God is not willing to live in the temple, it's not a temple, because a temple is a place where God dwells. And the church has to be the place where God dwells or the body of believers um, and also the gatherings of believers okay, where two or three are gathered in my name, I will be there. Right? That's what God has promised us. So God's presence uh, is, is what makes us who we are as the church. If we don't have God's presence and we have all the other activities going on, um, we are missing out on the um, uh, of of what makes us the people of God. So uh, let's talk a little more about the temple. So Paul, while writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17, he says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? Okay? So the concept of the temple is... Um, one where God dwells. In this case, Paul is saying that the Spirit of God dwells in you. That's why you're the temple. If the Spirit of God does not dwell in you. It doesn't make us a temple. And he goes on to talk about uh, keeping ourselves holy because we are the temple. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Uh, and many uh, a time, this a passage is quoted um, with an individual in mind. You know, we say, oh, this body is a temple of the Holy Spirit um, and, uh, you know, we must keep it holy. We uh, uh, we must uh, not engage, right, in, in things that defile the body and especially sexual immorality, things like that. So we talk about it in uh, the individual, at the individual level. But if you look at it, uh, we can also apply this and Paul was talking in terms of the community of believers as well. So uh, don't you know that you are the temple of God or the body of believers, the, the brethren, okay, the disciples, use whichever term uh, that you would like to, but the people of God are meant to be the temple of God. And he was saying, look, in your gathering, in your community, uh, it's the spirit of God who dwells in your midst. And don't forget that. So as a community, live such that uh, God delights to uh, come and dwell in your midst and live a holy life. And that was the encouragement that um, Paul was bringing to the people. Now, this concept of God coming and dwelling in a place, Okay. We see this uh, from the time God instructed Moses to build a tabernacle. A tabernacle is a tent. So we know that Moses and the people, they were a moving community. So they did not have a temple which was established. Uh, but you know, as they moved around, they could uh, set up a place of worship wherever they went. So the tabernacle of Moses and God gave a pattern. We see in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 8 um, tells us that the heavenly pattern, you know, in heaven, heaven is already the temple because God dwells there. God's presence is there. God is worshipped in heaven. And Hebrews 8 tells us that God gave that heavenly pattern to Moses. 
and you know he was given um, like a blueprint and uh, he was told okay uh, have the outer court have the inner court have the holy of uh, the holy place the holy of holies so all this was in the pattern of the worship of heaven and god told him to construct it and build it uh you know wherever the uh, children of israel were at that point so tabernacle uh, moses did that and uh, in the tabernacle you no know, one special uh, furniture which was you know built uh, and, and was given prominence was the ark of the covenant so the ark of the covenant that's the place that god chose to come down upon the ark of the covenant okay so why is the ark of the covenant so important for the tabernacle because without the ark of the covenant god cannot come down okay and god's presence um filled the tabernacle because of the ark of the covenant so that place of meeting you know that that place uh, of of uh, allowing god to come uh, and uh, manifest himself visit us you know that's what makes the tabernacle the tabernacle so without god's presence it it'll just be um, you know some uh, ritualistic worship traditional worship that goes on in a certain place uh, that god instituted and that's about it but the holy of holies the ark of the covenant and the presence of god you know that came upon the ark of the covenant made all the difference in the tabernacle and uh, we know that again the tabernacle was it is a shadow of the real worship that goes on in heaven uh, and and uh, uh, heaven is god's temple because god's presence dwells there so you know just along these these thoughts we will continue we'll study more about the church being the temple of god right now we'll take a break because we've uh, we have uh, you know run out of time so let's take a 10 minute break we'll come back and discuss more about the church being the temple of god okay so see you in 10 minutes class thank you